Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out this evening um, to participate in this Lighthouse Lecture. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the university for the opportunity um, to work with the university in partnership um, on tackling big problems. Uh, one thing we do know is that problems do not solve themselves. Now, many of you may be wondering why I refer to Australian ports and shipping policy as a wicked problem. Um, to be honest, I suspect if you ask people to put, on a, a, put a list together of wicked problems, they'll ran through them, energy, um, immigration. I don't think many people would put ports and, pol and shipping in Australia as a wicked problem. However, a wicked problem is a loaded term for those of us who have had the opportunity, dare I say, the pleasure of having studied public policy. It is a term given to the most complex, intractable, open policy problems. The definition of wicked problem was first used in 1973 in Berkeley University um, by two urban planners, uh, Riddle and Weber. And I believe that those definitions are still relevant today. Riddle and Weber identified key characteristics of a wicked problem, including the solution is, in, is dependent on how the problem is defined. Stakeholders have different views and frames for understanding the problem. Constraints that the problem is subject to and the resources required to solve the, it change over time, and the problem is never truly solved. I believe all of these characteristics exist when considering potential solutions or future directions of Australia's ports and shipping policy. Unfortunately, in order to reach agreement on how to fix a wicked problem, the first thing you have to do is agree there is a problem at all. For Australia's importers, exporters and consumers, which basically touches everyone in this room, different stakeholders have different versions of what the problem is. Even some question if there is a problem at all. The proposition I advance tonight is that when it comes to ports and shipping policy, the problem is that there is a policy vacuum in Australia. In effect, national and state policy makers have ceded the space to the private sector and this has created policy misalignment. You may find this a somewhat ironic statement from the CEO of a privately owned port in Newcastle and in with my private, previous role as head of transport policy for the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. But it does position me uniquely to speak on the matter. Having worked for the past four years in the Merce Group at SITSA, it has become evident that Australia's ports and shipping policy, which ports policy with the responsibility rests with the state and shipping with the national government, those policies bear little resemblance to what is actually going on in the world. Now this represents a serious risk for Australia's future. Port operators are in effect stewards or custodians of infrastructure assets that are critical to the national interest. Port operators have been left to determine the infrastructure and asset needs of Australia's importers and exporters into the future. Actually, to be accurate, with the exception of New South Wales, port operators have been left to determine the infrastructure and asset needs of Australia's importers and exporters into the future. In other words, they have been left to plan Australia's future freight and logistics supply chain solutions. I stated a moment ago that the answer to the question of whether there is a wicked problem in ports and shipping policy depends on who you ask. So let's create the framework for the discussion. When we talk about ports and shipping policy, we must consider waterside infrastructure, the channel and berth length, depth and width, turning basin, turning basin capacity, the ease of access and egress to the port, and whether the waterside infrastructure can grow and accommodate or accommodate increased volume as required. Landside infrastructure, wharf infrastructure, um, capability and capacity, rail and road connectivity, storage space, urban congestion, last mile access ease or difficulty, and whether the landside infrastructure can grow or accommodate increased volumes if required. All of these considerations should be informed by global trade, transport or logistics development and trends. Globalisation has taught the world that being part of global trade is critical to our national development and its population's increased quality of life. In the case of Australia, this is doubly so. Yet for an island nation entirely reliant on sea trade, shipping policy forms very little of the national lexicon around the international freight challenges and opportunities. Speaking with personal experience from 
um, almost 10 years in federal government policy setting in politics, it never changed a single vote. So ask yourself how much politicians actually worry. Even when we do discuss shipping policy in federal politics, it is always domestic and it's very insular. Coastal shipping has generated multiple reports, numerous in, um, parliamentary inquiries and lots of political debate. And all that since the 1990s. But it has always focused on the movement of goods around Australia. The recent discussions about a strategic shipping fleet are too embryotic um, to be able to provide commentary in this speech tonight. This state of affairs is not surprising when you consider the Australian government sold its international trading national shipping line, ANL, in 1998. From that point on, the, the general attitude was the Australian government did not need to focus on international shipping developments or trends anymore. This lack of focus is reinforced by the fact that ports and ports policy is a state responsibility. It is up to the ports to ensure that Australia keeps pace with international transport and logistics developments and opportunities. In the past, Australian ports have been subject to good public policy de design and making. One would hope so, given we are, it is a critical part of our economy from both our trading point of view, our standard of living and our future prosperity. Now put this into context, Daryl already mentioned Australia. Australia's trade moves 99% by sea, in and out. We're the fifth largest shipping task in the world. So good public policy, which is supposed to create the greatest good for the largest number of people, and I would hope that that's not a contestable statement. But in the case of, inf so in the case of infrastructure over the number of years, over the last couple of decades actually, we have actually seen government and private sector work well together to achieve this because government and commercial can come together and can be aligned in an objective. The motivations might be different, but the outcome is the same. I would put ports into that basket. Good public policy calls for ports to be large and as modern as global trade requires and to be responsive to global shipping developments. Clearly that will ensure the public is best served. The private sector would want the same thing for commercial reasons. In the past, public policy has been a priority for Australia. In the 1960s, a new freight technology called containerisation emerged. It consisted of 20-foot enclosed steel boxes. They were uniform and intermodal, capable of transport across trucks, rail, trains, without changing the handling gear. The Australian government saw the cost advantages of this disruptive technology, and during the 1960s and 70s, the East Coast ports established new container terminals. They were Port Botany, Swanson Dock in Melbourne and Fisherman's Island in Brisbane. Obviously, the immediate response to global developments has paid dividends for Australia, and it continues to do so. Global container trade has grown by 8.1% per annum since 1980. Over the next 15 years, Australia's container ports will see growth volumes of around 4.2% per annum. The growth in containerisation has seen a corresponding growth in the size of vessels built to carry them. The reason for this development is easy to understand. Containers are about volume. The more containers on the vessel, the lower the unit cost per container. So the trend for larger vessels. In the 1970s, a container ship carried around 2,500 20-foot containers, or TEUs. In the 1980s, ships increased around 4,500 TEUs. In 2006, Maersk introduced the Triple E, which carried 15,000 TEUs and it was the entry point into the ultra-large container vessels. Over the past few years, shipping companies have launched container vessels of 20,000 plus TEUs. Today, around 45% of new build capacity is for container vessels 15,000 TEUs or above. The ULCVs can replace up to three conventional container ships and steeply reduce the slot cost, which is the cost of shipping one container. In Europe, a ULCV has a slot cost 52% lower than a 5,000 TEU vessel. But to get those savings, ports have to be able to handle these larger vessels, and most importantly, quickly. Ports in Europe, Asia and America have been upsizing their infrastructure to service these larger vessels. They are ensuring they have deep and or wider channels, longer key lines and key cranes. I mentioned the importance of speed. For larger vessels to deliver the productivity benefits possible, wharfside and landside efficiency is an absolute. 
This means clearing containers from the wharves and getting them to intermodal centres in great volumes quickly. To achieve volumes, global ports are moving to automated handling, equipment and long trains, all orchestrated by digital management platforms. In California, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are in the middle of a massive build-out of their port infrastructure to take the ultra-large vessels. China has just completed an automated container terminal outside of Shanghai, specifically for the ultra-large vessels. But the efforts of the global ports does not stop inside their port boundaries. For example, the ports of New Jersey and New York spent $1.7 billion US raising the Bayonne Bridge specifically so it could fit ultra-large container vessels into their container docks. Back over in Los Angeles, the California government is closing down the Harbour Freeway that connects San Pedro area with the city of Los Angeles. Now, why would the home of cars decommission a freeway? And it's for their container ports. San Pedro is home to the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, the largest container ports in the US. For decades, the Harbour Freeway has been the port's trucking route south of the CBD, but no more. California has a project called America's Global Freight Gateway, Southern California Rail Project, catchy. It responds to a number of issues we would recognise in Sydney. The Los Angeles container ports will double their throughput by 2035. The ports cannot flood the roads with more container trucks. Transport infrastructure must comply with emissions and environmental regulations, and the ports must match the container volumes on the new ULCVs. So Los Angeles is building its container ports around trains. In summary, California is taking ports and shipping policy seriously. So what's happening on the east coast of Australia where 80% of our container trade resides? Unfortunately, our east coast ports who handle containers are not able to handle the new ULCVs. And in one case, they prefer to ignore the problem. The east coast container ports typically accept container ships of around about 5,000 TU. In Port Botany's last half year trade report, 86% of the ships that visited the port were 6,000 TUs or below. Now you will find a Houston Kemp report um, on the table outside the room. This report is particularly relevant for this discussion. The Port of Newcastle commissioned that report. We did so to understand the containerisation market and the impacts and opportunities for Australia. Now place this in the context of the policy vacuum I mentioned. A regional port needed to commission a state of industry report on global shipping trends, <coughs> containerisation and port capacity in Australia and New Zealand. One would have thought that this would be ready to hand with our national and state policy makers eagerly looking over the trade horizon and asking what next. The report confirms what is well known in the global shipping industry. Container vessels are getting larger and their capacity continues to grow. For Australia, this means that some of our channels are not big enough for these vessels and the available land area in our existing ports is constrained by urban encroachment, thereby restricting the ability of existing ports to efficiently handle the volumes of these larger vessels. Now, one way to solve this problem would be uh, to solve this land constraint is to move the containers away from the port as quickly as possible. The best mode of transport for this is rail. Since unlike most countries in the world, Australia doesn't rely on transshipment, Unfortunately, the East Coast container ports cannot get long trains onto the dock. Global experience demonstrates that the efficient port train is ideally 1,200 to 1,800 metres long. Port Botany's capacity is 680 metres long, Port of Melbourne is 640 metres long, and the Port of Brisbane is not connected to a designated rail freight system, and none of those ports will be connected to the inland rail system in stage one. As an aside, Port of Newcastle, we can handle 1.5 to 1.8 kilometre trains. Consequently, the East Coast ports rely on trucks to shift the overwhelming majority of their containers. Now, this is all publicly available information, just in case you thought I was trying to be selective in my use of data. Now, I would argue that the port owners on the East Coast of Australia cannot truly respond to the global move to ULCVs. They actually need to significantly upsize their infrastructure to be able to handle larger vessels, let alone the ULCVs. But to do that is to require very courageous state governments. <coughs> For example, in Melbourne, they could raise the Westgate Bridge to allow 10,000 plus TU vessels access. In Brisbane, they could ex um, do extensive land resumptions through residential areas to allow the rail connections required. And in Port Botany, I suppose they could move Kingston Smith Airport, double or triple the train, the train length and probably create a fully dedicated freight line. 
They could do all those things, but with political will? Hmm. Another way forward is to convince the public and governments that container vessels will stay the same size as they were in the 1990s, so there is nothing to worry about. A month ago, I was actually at a parliamentary inquiry and heard New South Wales ports give evidence that Australia was decades away from having to worry about container ships of 10,000 TU. The problem with that statement is that we already do have a port in our region that services container vessels over 10,000 TUs. In fact, it's 11,500 TUs and that port is in New Zealand. Auckland Harbour is limited in the ships it can take, so the New Zealand government encouraged the development of a secondary container port 18, uh, 180 kilometres south in Tauranga. Uh, Newcastle is 200 kilometres north of Sydney, by the way. The port of Tauranga dredged the channel and built a port that takes larger vessels. They are now on a trade route that includes East, Af East Asia, North America, South America. The port of Tauranga overtook Auckland a few years ago and is now facilitating container numbers similar to the port of Brisbane. The New Zealanders are applying a simple policy. If you increase port infrastructure for the larger vessels, the trade will come and your customers will have lower costs. The economy wins. And if your existing port cannot do that, build a new one. So that the economy and the population wins. And that to me is an effective and good public policy. I should note at this time that this inertia, will for all structural, is not universal in Australia ports. Australian resources ports have all expanded to service the massive cape-sized vessels and other large bulk and or oil and gas vessels. These decisions have been made with little or no fanfare and in response to global demand and vessel developments. And why were they made? To ensure Australia's competitive advantage in Asia will continue for the next 20 years. The ultra-large container vessels are not a novelty. Something that is 45% of global ship new build programs cannot be called a passing phase. The USL, ULCVs are the way we will trade, creating significant economic benefits for the nation, assuming they can access our ports. Okay, so let's step back for a second and ask ourselves, how did we get here? There were two milestones. One, 1998, the Commonwealth sold a &L and basically moved out of the shipping business. From 2010, state governments started selling or started privatising their ports, with the crown jewels being the fast-growing capital city container ports. And I would argue they moved out of port infrastructure policy. One of the outcomes of the government withdrawal from ports and shipping was the disappearance of experienced policy people in the public service. These days, if a government needs a, a policy paper on shipping or ports, they go to a consultancy firm or they assemble an industry panel of people who work in the industry. All very familiar. The states have consequently become short-sighted. Most port policy is actually an extension of the roads policy programs, concerned with building roads to alleviate congestion around the capital cities. The policy reflects that port owners want, which is in the major capital cities on the east coast, that public roads and train lines are there to help shift more boxes and not incur the wrath of the commuting public. Because imagine if one day the commuting public started asking the question, why is there a container terminal in the middle of our city clogging up our roads? Another problem is that, another problem that is looming that this policy vacuum is not addressing relates to international, the nature of international shipping and regulations. Australia has always been recognised, has always recognised the importance of having a voice at the, at the International Maritime Organisation. As an island nation so reliant on shipping, that has always made obvious sense. But with such standing comes clear obligations. One is that Australia has always ratified IMO regulations. We are a good maritime player, even if we only account for 14 flag vessels today. Now consider what the IMO's 2020 regulations on sulphur dioxide from bunker fuel means for Australia. Some of the older, smaller vessels visiting our ports burn this bunker fuel. But fixing these ships is expensive. That shipping lines may probably scrap them or they may pay the levies um, as part of the penalties, which they will pass along to Australian businesses. <coughs> Some international players may decide to ban the sulphur emitting um, ships altogether. Either way, Australia is in trouble if we rely on those vessels alone. The older, smaller container vessels will be dirtier, less efficient, 
and the slot price will be higher for importers and exporters compared to our global competitors as they move to ultra-large vessels. This is just one aspect of deciding or being unable to adapt to global shipping developments. Another is human capital. Australia really doesn't develop maritime jobs anymore. We have the Australian Maritime College and we have a couple of other training institutions, but the numbers being turned out for an island nation is insignificant. At the Port of Newcastle, we are more interested in the land side jobs. Where are the schedulers, the surveyors, the hydrographers, the, mind you, they just water base, the terminal supervisors and operators, the freight and logistics managers and the planners coming from? Where are they being trained? Take, for example, the Port of Newcastle's plan for a fully automated, electrified, ultra large container vessel container terminal. Let's speculate the New South Wales government removes the impediment preventing the port from building Australia's first ULCV container terminal this year. Best case, the Newcastle container terminal will start operations in 2023-2024. In terms of skill sets, that would mean the port would need computer programmers, freight and logistics analysts, automation, electrician and mechanical engineers and programmers, remote control operators, warehouse and distribution managers, designers, intermodal managers and operators, the list goes on. But given the automatic and electrified nature of the container terminal, the education foundations for a lot of these jobs will be in STEM. Now, we will need some of these people with these skills in five years. That means a student in year 12 today needs to make the decision about thinking, the, thinking about working for the Port of Newcastle's container terminal now. Now, one clear benefit that the port has is our proximity to Williamtown, the home of the Joint Strike Fighter program. We are aware that the skill sets needed for the JSF program are similar to those needed for a fully automated container terminal, intermodal and warehouse distribution centre. But of course, that will mean that the port will be competing against the Department of Defence for those highly skilled people. So the labour pool might be tight. If this is correct, the pool needs to be wider and deeper. How agile is Australia's education sector to respond to such a demand, especially when the port cannot even say when we will be able to build the container terminal. What I can tell you is that it is a key task for the container terminal project team to work with education providers to map out a solution. Another area of collaboration that needs to happen, Port of Newcastle is the home to the, old, uh, to a, the BHP steel mill. We have a lot of land that is designated contaminated today. One of the tasks I've given the environmental team at the port is go out and find out what is going on in the rest of the world. Maybe there are developments going on that will take our contaminated land and turn it into commercially viable land. It is an area ripe for opportunity for collaboration with research centres. Now, this is all about problem solving. And with respect to problem solving, I would argue that having sold the container ports, state governments, deliberately or otherwise, allowed the private owners to formulate policy, often from their own data. New South Wales Ports issued a major report two weeks ago through a big four firm, but the report's disclaimer actually revealed that some of the data had come from the port owners themselves. Um, I'm reminded of the words of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a New York senator in the US, um, that basically when everybody's entitled to their op own opinion, but not to their own facts. In New South Wales, the impediments to responding to global developments in shipping is, exa is exacerbated by the way the New South Wales government privatised the ports of Botany, Kembla and Newcastle. The first was that two ports were sold together, so that killed competition. Then there is the, the condition that, that Newcastle had to pay a penalty to Botany if we handle more than a token number of containers. A key characteristic of a monopoly is that where it cannot benefit from a change in the marketplace, well, it will oppose the change or it just won't adopt it. Of course, one of the truisms of economics is that regulatory intervention is always required in the event of market failure. However, in New South Wales, regulatory protections have actually been put in place to ensure an incumbent monopoly can prevent the efficient operation of the marketplace. This is not speculation on my part. This is precisely what is happening in New South Wales. This is government policy. The New South Wales government has decided which regions can be winners and which areas must wait, if at all, for the right to compete for global trade and vessels. I put it to you that when you have monopolies, the vested interests are not only opposed to change, but they are increasingly non-commercial, the very reason that privatisation occurred in the first place. 
When you look at New Zealand and California, you see public and commercial policy operating together. In both of those jurisdictions, the port owners strive for greater productivity and efficiency because they compete in a global marketplace. We do not see that happening in Australia. We have policies designed to prop up soon to be uncompetitive ports with endless public spending on surrounding roads and all this for ports that cannot be part of the new global shipping system. So let's look at what port policy, let's have a look at port policy in this country um, could be. In the first place, policy should recognise that Australia needs the capacity to trade with large, low-cost ships, and those ships come from other countries. Trade is global. So a good starting point for port policy is, when, is that we, Australia, are competing or cooperating with other countries and their ports to get the most efficient supply chains. If we accept that we should follow global best practice for container shipping, then good policy would encourage greenfield sites in Australia where the infrastructure can be built without urban encroachment. This would mean that port policy would encourage regional ports with an abundance of land and good channels, particularly to develop secondary ports for container trade. My experience in government was that if you, you would literally kill if you had a, public, a private sector regional development opportunity and it was their money. I have to say, as an aside, six months in this job, I'm starting to discover that I'm unique amongst Australian CEOs. I'm not rent-seeking. We actually have our own money. <laughs> our capital cities are struggling with, uh, over, with overpopulation, urban growth, congestion that requires billions of dollars to solve if they can be solved at all. All colours of the political spectrum argue for regional development and growth. If they really care about regional development, they would encourage the development of regional ports. They are a great economic amplifier and they, con and they connect the regions to the world. They also connect our cities and our states. Encouraging regional ports to compete for container trade would enable a coastal feeder port system where the very large ships come into one port and the smaller container vessels transship around Australia. This is what happens in Asia, in Europe, in America and in New Zealand and the South Pacific. In the end, however, the most important test of ports policy is this. Does it work for Australians? Does it drive lower trade costs and boost our economy? If the port and shipping policy setting is not about reducing costs and encouraging the most efficient and cleanest ships by ensuring our state and national port infrastructure can handle them, then the policy is delivering the worst of all worlds. We are, you are not, under those policy settings, offering good public outcome which would be a lower transport cost. And you are not offering a good commercial outcome, which comes when private owners constantly improve their productivity and efficiency in response to market forces and competition. In conclusion, I think there is a policy vacuum in ports policy that governments have to fill in partnership with commercial operators. Ensuring that private port owners are looking to the future is a non-controversial role for the governments. Rather than putting their efforts in maintaining port monopolies, governments should be more concerned about promoting the public good, which is usually served by competition and improved efficiency. The crux of good policy is striving for the greatest public good. One of the possible strategies for tackling wicked problems is the collaborative strategy. This particular approach has been proven the most effective when dealing with wicked problems that have many stakeholders amongst whom power is dispersed. At the core of the collaboration strategy is a win-win view of problem solving. I suggest that the strategy for solving the wicked problem of ports and shipping policy in Australia is for the governments to do their jobs, understand global shipping and ports developments, and to ensure that the private operators of the ports and other maritime infrastructure are preparing for these future developments. Private port operators need to be fully aware of global developments, both from a business development opportunity and as custodians of some of Australia's most critical infrastructure. The collaboration is there, it is quite easy. Governments should only have to step in if market failure occurs, if an owner of a port does not want to move with the world's trends and ensure that Australia is well served. But to be fair, how, who can criticise a commercial company for having made a decision that what's in my best interest? Nobody said a commercial company had to be in Australia's best interest. Together, the governments and private port operators then need to agree on how to ensure sharp edge competition delivers the benefits of low cost transport, a place for Australia in global trade, but a certainty that critical infrastructure is upgraded as required for the benefit of the nation. 
in a commercially sustainable manner. Thank you very much. Thank you.